We now come to the urgent question. Liz Kendall. Yeah, yeah. Secretary of State, if you will make a statement on testing of care home residents during the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic was an unprecedented global health emergency involving a novel coronavirus that we were still learning about day by day, even hour by hour. Even in those early days, the UK Government and colleagues in my department were clear testing would be crucial. That is why, Mr Speaker, the former Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Member for West Suffolk, set ambitious testing targets to drive a true step change in the quantity of tests, because he knew testing would be a vital lifeline until the vaccines could be developed and proven safe and effective. The importance of testing was never in doubt, and there was full agreement on that in every part of government, from the Chief Medical Officer to the Health Secretary to the Prime Minister. But in a situation where we had the capacity to test at most a few thousand each day, tough decisions about prioritisation had to be made, decisions that were taken on the best public health advice available. And thanks in no small part to the bold testing ambitions driven by government, we were able to build the largest testing network in Europe. I want to put on record my thanks to all those who worked tirelessly on this mission day and night, from civil servants to the NHS, and of course our incredible social care workforce who did so much to look after their residents. They all deserve our lasting gratitude. Mr Speaker, the situation in our care homes was extremely difficult in the pandemic, not just in England, but across the UK and indeed across the world because of the vulnerability of residents and the large numbers of people who come in and out of care homes. It is vital that we learn lessons. It's equally vital, Mr Speaker, that we learn those lessons in the right context. I should mention that selective snippets of WhatsApp conversations give a limited and at times misleading insight into the machinery of government at the time. That is why the COVID inquiry is so important, so we have the right preparations in place to meet future threats and challenges. Thank you. Mr Speaker, throughout the COVID pandemic, Ministers repeatedly claimed they threw a protective ring around England's care homes and always followed the evidence and scientific advice. But WhatsApp messages from the former Health Secretary revealed in today's Telegraph suggest nothing could be further from the truth. Can the Minister now confirm that the Chief Medical Officer first advised the Government to test all residents going into care homes in early April 2020. Can she explain why the former Health Secretary rejected this advice and failed to introduce community testing until the 14th of August, a staggering four months later? Can she publish the evidence that following the advice would have muddied the waters, yep. as the member for West Suffolk claimed? And can she confirm that 17,678 people died of COVID in care homes between the CMO's advice and the government finally deciding to act? She should know, Mr Speaker, because she was responsible for care homes at the time. Yeah. Now, former ministers are touring the studios this morning, claiming this delay was simply because there weren't enough tests. Where is the evidence for this? Yep. And even if tests were in short supply, why weren't care home residents prioritised yeah. when the devastating impact of COVID was there for all to see? Now, Mr Speaker, nobody denies that dealing with COVID was unbelievably difficult, especially in the early days. But care home residents and staff were simply not a priority. Yet the former Prime Minister and Health Secretary were first warned about the emerging horror in care homes by my honourable uh, friend, the Member for Hove, in March 2020, yep. Yep. 
I myself raised the lack of testing in care homes with the Health Secretary. On the 8th of April, the 28th of April, the 19th of May and the 17th of yes. June, long before the CMO's advice was finally followed. The Minister will no doubt say all these issues will be looked at in the public inquiry, but the findings from this won't be available for years. Mr Speaker, the families of the 43,000 care home residents who lost their lives will be appalled yes. at the former Health Secretary attempting to rewrite history, an attempt that will turn to ashes exactly. along with his TV career. We need more humility and less celebrity from the member for yeah, West Suffolk. Yeah, and above all, we need answers. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I say actually that I think it's relatively easy for the Honourable Member to come to the House today and make these highly political points. And knowing actually how she and I worked together in the pandemic. And she and I talked about all that we were doing to look after people in care homes. I am, as I say, shocked and disappointed in the tone that she has taken today when we are dealing with extremely serious questions. I will turn first to some of the difficult prioritisation decisions that were made given the limited quantity of testing that we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Mr Speaker, the Government followed the expert public health advice available at the time. We had the capacity to test just 3,000 cases a day in mid-March, and I am sure colleagues will understand why the health advice was at the time to prioritise those working on our NHS front line and, for instance, the testing of people in hospitals who had symptoms and, indeed, within care homes, again, people with symptoms. In fact, the courts have already agreed that our prioritisation decisions on testing were completely rational. As we dramatically ramped up testing capacity, Mr Speaker, we also adjusted that prioritisation in line with the public health advice and the capacity. So by mid-April, just a month later, with testing capacity exceeding 38,000, we were then in a position to test more widely. In fact, that's reflected in our adult social care plan, which was published on the 15th of April. That made clear that everyone being discharged from a hospital to a care home should be tested, even if asymptomatic, and that all discharged patients, regardless of the results of their test, should be isolated for 14 days. And it's worth reflecting, Mr Speaker, just what a dramatic increase in testing the Government oversaw, from just 3,000 in March 2020 to over 38,000 in mid-April to over 100,000 by mid-May, to the point where we could test many millions in a single week. We established the largest testing network in Europe from a standing start, and the science proves that it saved lives. Now, the hon. Lady asked about uh, some of the content of the WhatsApp messages which have been published. And I would say to her that it's a selection of messages from a larger quantity of messages. And actually, clearly, while um, there were discussions and debates between ministers and between colleagues which took place in part on WhatsApp, there were clearly meetings and conversations and other forums in which advice was given and decisions made. And a huge quantity of that is with the uh, public inquiry. But I can say, to, for instance, that a meeting to, the, to discuss the uh, implementation of the uh, advice on testing um, was not referenced in the WhatsApp messages that she is talking about. But, for instance, there is an, uh, an email following exactly this exchange um, that she's referring to that says, we can press straight away, we can press ahead straight away with hospitals testing patients who are going to care homes and we should aspire to as soon as capacity allows and when we've worked out an operational way of delivering this that everyone going into a care home from the community could be tested so as i say to her she's there's very selective information that she is basing her 
comments on. As I said, the Honourable Lady knows how the Government and me personally strained every single worked day and night, did everything in our power to help people, and specifically the most vulnerable during the pandemic. She and I spoke about it regularly during our frequent calls. In fact, at the time, I appreciated her perspective, her questions, her insights from her own area of Leicester. And I say to her, we should go about this discussion in the right way for yeah, the country. Yeah, yeah. This is not the time to play political yeah, yeah. games. We should look to save lives. That's the purpose yeah, of the public yeah. inquiry, to learn lessons in the right way in case this should ever happen again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, no, no, you uh, my uh, honourable friend will ad- uh, agree that uh, it was Labour that called for a public inquiry. Uh, the government agreed to it. It's a full public inquiry. You couldn't have a better judge than Dame Heather Hallett, somebody one of the most experienced and distinguished judges. She'll do a very thorough job. And what we're seeing today, today is a bit of trial by media and party politics to sheer greed. Yeah, 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 yeah. My yes. friend is exactly right. We're having a public inquiry. The government is fully cooperating with that public inquiry, so they have all the information that is required to look through uh, all that happened, to investigate it, uh, and, and, and rather than trying to score political points, to actually truly learn lessons for the benefit of the country. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> on, the <second> of April, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> on the 2nd of April 2020, I wrote to the former Health and Social Care Secretary Jointly with my right honourable friend, the member for Leicester South, highlighting the urgent need for testing in care homes for staff and residents, and particularly for patients being discharged from hospital. (coughs) I knew, as did other colleagues at the time, that without testing in my constituency, care homes in my constituency and those across the country were suffering a heavy toll of deaths of residents. Indeed, one of our care home managers died of COVID in my constituency. Further, at a session of the Health and Social Care Committee, in July 2021, I asked the Right Honourable Member for West Suffolk why the government had not taken up the offer from care providers of facilities to isolate people discharged from hospital before admitting them to care homes. He told me that he did not know anything about the letter, despite it being sent by Care England. Will the Minister now admit that the Department and Ministers failed to understand and to involve social care in the key decisions about the COVID pandemic? and ignored letters for offering help which could have saved lives. Yeah. 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 Minister. Uh, well, the Honourable Lady is right about the importance of testing, and it's a view that uh, she has, but you know, I had at the time, uh, and as indeed some of the exchanges will uh, show how I, as social care minister, and as you would expect, was arguing very hard for testing for care homes. I know, of course, that other ministers and other people were arguing for the things that they had oversight of, and then ultimately, of course, the health secretary and prime minister have to make decisions based every step of the way, clearly, on the public health, the scientific advice on these things as we did. I mean, to that point, during the course of the pandemic, as the capacity allowed, millions of tests were distributed to care homes. And as I've already said, as the capacity increased, te- care homes were prioritised in that process. And specifically to uh, one of the points she made, the, uh, the guidance set out on the 15th of April was not only that everyone discharged from hospital to a care home should be tested, but also that they should be isolated. Exactly. Peter Burke. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, It seems to me that the opposition want to rewrite history. The fact is, at the time, people didn't know what was right or what was wrong. The Minister, the Secretary of State, listened to a whole lot of advice and then had to make a decision. Even one of the WhatsApp messages I've seen says, tell me if I'm wrong. So it seems to me what should happen is the Covid inquiry should deal with all these matters properly. The one question I would have for the Minister is, is it possible to get the Covid inquiry to report earlier? Uh, 
Well, again, I completely agree with my honourable friend about the COVID inquiry being the right place to go through the details of what happened, who said what, and, as he said, the genuine debates that there were, of course, behind the scenes, because this was a new virus, and at the time we had only limited information about it. For instance, it wasn't known when it first hit our shores who was going to be most vulnerable to it. We didn't know about things like asymptomatic transmission. So there was a huge amount of uncertainty at the time about which the, the best possible decisions were made. To his question about the timing of the public inquiry, I think that is not something which is in the control of ministers. Daisy Cooper. Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, sorry, my apologies. Um, the, leaked, the leaked WhatsApp messages from the then Health Secretary, the Right Honourable Member for West Suffolk, showed that despite a shortage in COVID tests in September 2020, one of the Minister's advisers sent a test to the Right Honourable Member for North East Somerset's home by courier. Wow. This is yet more evidence that it's one rule for Conservative ministers and another for everyone else. So, can the Minister please inform the House? How many other government ministers, Conservative MPs and their families received priority tests during the pandemic when there was a shortage of tests? Uh, well, actually, I'll say to her, um, much though uh, it's a difficult thing for me as a minister to see WhatsApp messages from me, in fact, uh, in the pages of the newspaper, if, she's, if he, she has read those, she will see that I was seeking a, a test for a member of my family and using exactly the same uh, a test, uh, app as everybody else to try and get access to a test that was needed. Mr Speaker, I seem to recall two years ago when there was a limited supply of testing equipment. There were all sorts of calls for certain groups to be uh, prioritised, and there were urgent calls for available beds in hospitals to be freed up to cope with the likely surge uh, in, uh, in cases. In hindsight, some of those priorities uh, may have been wrong ones, uh, but at the time it was an urgent situation. Will my honourable friend confirm that exactly the same set of priorities uh, about access to testing prevailed in Wales, and it took the Welsh Government two weeks longer to make mandated testing to care home residents in Wales than it did in England. And why are we not seeing equal outrage from the opposition about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he makes a really important point about the challenges that were faced, as I mentioned earlier, around the world handling uh, the pandemic, but very conspicuously for us across the UK, and decisions that were having to be taken in Scotland, <coughs> Wales and, and Northern Ireland as well as here in England. And the other thing I'd say to that is, you know, were members opposite in the position that we were in in government and having to make these difficult decisions, I'm sure that they, like us, actually, would have strained every sinew and done their very best to make the best possible decisions in the situation of limited information. Yeah. David. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Even if we now know that the Secretary of State was not following the scientific advice, the Minister for Care was in her job at the time these decisions were being made. Can the Minister explain why she didn't do the right thing then? Was she not listening to the Chief Medical Officer either? Yeah, yeah. I fear she didn't hear my previous answer, which was to say that actually the, 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 the public health advice and the advice of the Chief Medical Officer was followed. Of course, there is uh, a job to do where you get the advice, and then you also have to look at the practicalities of implementation. As the volume of tests became available, those tests were used as advised following the public health advice. Dr. I'm not going to forget the total, totally shameless politicking of the pandemic yeah. undertaken by yes. those opposite. I remember very specifically throughout the pandemic, she's left her place now, the deputy leader, talking about, and the, the shadow leader of the opposition talking about how we had the worst death toll in Europe, and they said that again and again and again and again. Actually, actually, and I hear the, the, the shadow minister from a steady position saying we did. The studies now show that, we, in fact, we were uh, ahead of Italy, ahead of Spain, broadly in line with France and Germany, and very far from the worst in Europe. Have we ever heard any of them come to this dispatch box and apologise and apologise for misleading the British public about our record in the pandemic? Does she agree that they might seek to do that before they further criticise us for our record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, he's, he is right on this, and the right thing to do for us as a country is reflect overall on how 
we handled the pandemic and the decisions that we made, and indeed how prepared we were in the first place. That's the right way to do it. Of course, you know, every life lost is a life that we regret losing. And I think about the families who've lost, whether it's mothers and fathers, brothers, sisters, grandmas. Husbands. No, it's, a, I, I'm, it's so deeply sad that so many lives were lost, but this is something that affected us here in England, say across the UK, and indeed across the world. But the right thing to do is for us to look at these things in the inquiry and the reasoned environment, and then use the lessons learned and the reflections of that inquiry to make sure that we can do better in the event that we should ever have to face another pandemic like it. Yeah. Karen Smith. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The government entered the pandemic unprepared, ignoring Operation Cygnus uh, and the lessons they could have done, and run the NHS at 96% capacity. That was part of the problem. We all know mistakes happen. We all know it was really difficult. But today is really disappointing because some humility should have been brought to yes. this. Yes. Over 17,000 people lost their lives. It is our job as the opposition to scrutinise the decisions. Yeah. The, the former Secretary of State has thrown his colleagues under a bus because of his own vanity, but mm. suggests that the government ministers need to use this time to actually come forward, now that ease the family suffering, right. with more detail on actually what did happen yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. before the inquiry. And there's already been a uh, uh, legal uh, investigation into um, some of the aspects that we are talking about today. But actually, you know, given the, the, the huge number of decisions we've made, the period of time we're talking about, actually, the right way to do this is bring all this evidence together in the form of a public inquiry, have it fully looked through, and that's the best way to answer the sorts of questions that she's looking for answers for. David Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a profoundly serious question, literally uh, a matter of life and death. And as such, I'm sure my honourable friend is right to say that the appropriate way to reach conclusions is through a proper public inquiry uh, conducted by a very distinguished judge. So can she assure the House that the government will be as transparent and open as possible in giving evidence to that public inquiry so that we can all be confident that at the end of this we have reached the appropriate conclusion. Uh, I can absolutely assure my right hand friend on that point that the government is sharing uh, with the public inquiry a huge quantity of evidence so that it can reach the best possible best informed conclusions. Clive Bafford. Speaker. The, the Emails and, uh, and WhatsApp messages expose the fact that the scientific advice was that people leaving hospital should be swabbed before they went into care homes, and that the government ignored that. Now that shows that the government was not following scientific advice. Now the minister has said that there were other priorities that had to be considered before they could implement that policy, but there's no one who'd be more aware of the competing priorities than someone like Professor Whitty. So what was it the government knew that Professor Whitty didn't when they decided not to follow his advice? Yeah, yeah. Again, I, it really feels like honourable members opposite have not been listening to my answers yeah, yeah, on yeah. this. The public health advice was followed and the situation here was a limited capacity of testing and this is not spelled out in those messages, because, as I said, there were other meetings and other conversations that took place. As soon as capacity was available, of tests was available, further testing was used for testing residents, being, people being discharged to care homes, for example. And I will say to him, having been care minister at the time, you know, how hard we, across government, not only me, but actually all of those involved in this, work to get millions of tests during the course of the pandemic to yeah. care homes to help protect those residents, yeah. followed by prioritising those in care homes for the vaccination. Because actually, when it came down to it, though testing was helpful, what really made a difference in the pandemic was when we were able to vaccinate people, and that's what really started to provide protection. James Wilde. 
Yeah, isn't it regrettable, if all too typical, that the Labour Party ignore that when the pandemic struck, there was only capacity for yeah. 2,000 tests a day, yeah. and the huge efforts that were successful to massively increase yeah. that yeah. capacity? Yeah. Instead, they choose to leap on partial information yeah. Yeah. to make political points, yeah. rather than listen yeah. for the full facts and the public inquiry. Yeah. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right how we <laughs> ramped up incredibly fast from a capacity of just 3,000 tests a day in, in March 2020 to over 38,000 in mid-April mid, mid to over 100,000 by May and then being able to test many millions uh, a, a week um, during the course of the pandemic. That was the most extraordinary increase in the capacity to produce and carry out and analyse tests and he's absolutely right to draw attention to it. Derek Twigg. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, I note that the Minister said that it's shocking what my honourable friendly member for Leicester West has said. It should be shocking about the number of people who died yeah. who might have been saved in the first place. But can yeah. I ask yeah. the, the Minister a specific yeah. question? Is she really saying that there was no rush to get people out of hospitals back into the community without being tested at the beginning of this pandemic? Mm. Oh. Uh, well, I think you know, the, the questions about the discharge policy that has been interrogated on a number of occasions, including, for instance, by select committees. And he'll well know, for instance, in general, and we know this you know, in the work we're doing right now on discharge, that it's rarely a good thing for somebody who's medically fit for discharge to continue to be in hospital beyond that time. So, of course, it's right that when people are medically fit, uh, they, should be, they should be discharged home. And the guidance of how that was done was set out on a number of occasions during the pandemic, and that guidance was updated both as we learnt more about the virus and as greater testing capacity became available. Alexander Stafford. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am very proud of this Conservative government's record during the pandemic. 400 million tests, a world leading and world beating vaccine programme, and £400 billion spent to keep jobs and people's prospects going. Clearly, hard decisions were made, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, but we shouldn't be reflecting on hindsight now. We should deal with the facts that are at hand. Does the Minister agree with me that this government will continue to take measures, and if, God forbid, there's another pandemic, we will not let the party politicking get in the way and actually make those decisions to protect lives, fund jobs, and keep our country going? He's absolutely right, and he's right to point out no, the extraordinary things that were done during the pandemic, and I don't think you know, government should, should seek to take credit for that, but, uh, so many people worked so incredibly hard, yeah, whether it was in local authorities, yeah. in social care, in the NHS, all those involved in supply chains, uh, for instance, so the huge efforts to actually get PPE out and to secure PPE at times when it was incredibly hard to get hold of across the world. So I, I'm glad that he draws attention to some of these things, and he's, he's absolutely right that we should reflect overall in the context of the public inquiry. Emily Orbuck. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. In April 2020, now disappeared government guidance in relation to hospital discharges stated negative tests are not required prior to transfers admissions into the care home. It was later reported that this minister then leaned on Public Health England to alter its proposed advice to care homes from ensuring that those discharged from hospital tested negative to not requiring any testing at all. Why at every stage was the government content to send people to their deaths in our care homes? Uh, I don't recognise her account uh, at all there. If she looks back in some of the, uh, one of the legal cases that has looked into this question, uh, she may find more accurate information about some of the conversations that went on yeah, behind yeah, yeah, the yeah. scenes. What I can assure her of was that in my capacity as social care minister, as you would expect, I fought the corner for people uh, in receiving care, both home care and in care homes throughout the pandemic. 
Aaron Bell. Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The leaked WhatsApp messages are obviously going to be partial and selective, but even reading them, I note that the Minister was doing her job on behalf of my constituents yeah, on a message yeah, 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 on the 8th yeah, of yeah, April yeah. speaking up for a care home in Newcastle under Lyme and raising that with Government and her fellow Ministers, and everyone, I think, was doing their best. Yeah. I've served on the Lessons Learned Select Committee, Madam Deputy Speaker, and there are lessons to be learned. They can be learned with the benefit of hindsight, but the hindsight we've seen from the opposition front bench today is opportunistic. The government, does she agree with me, the government was doing everything it could to respond to an unprecedented situation under severe pressure, severe supply and severe capacity constraints. Uh, he's 100% right that the context clearly of this is absolutely important as part of this conversation. And uh, a global pandemic about which very little was known, about which we worked incredibly hard to find out more and continually made the best possible decisions in the light of the information we had, at all times prioritising protecting people, saving lives, particularly those, as we learnt, who would be most vulnerable. And it's extremely disappointing to see an attempt to make, play politics with this issue. Uh, James Harden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Care home residents and their families weren't just failed at the beginning of the pandemic, they were failed for the months and years that followed as families and loved ones were prevented from visiting. Now, the, the leaked WhatsApp showed that the Minister was arguing against the ban on visiting. Can she say why we saw that sustained for so long throughout the pandemic and what plans she has now to make sure that the families of loved ones in care homes have the right to visit if this ever happens again. Uh, I know uh, how strongly my uh, the honourable member feels about this, and clearly we're having ongoing conversations about visiting uh, at the moment in uh, in care homes. It's it's evident in the WhatsApps that I was concerned during the pandemic to make sure that families were able to see loved ones in care homes. As I've been saying in a number of responses to questions today, clearly public health advice had to be taken into account all the way through the pandemic and getting the right balance um, between protecting people from the risk of COVID being taken into care homes and uh, seeing uh, friends and family was something which I'm sure, uh, as part of the public inquiry, will be some of the conversations discussions that will be looked into in that to answer a question such as his about the decisions taken on visiting. And I will continue to work with him here and now to make sure that those who are currently in care homes get the visiting that we think they need. Uh, Emma Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy <coughs> Speaker. Today's front page of The Telegraph revealing that the medical advice was not followed will be heartbreaking for so many families up and down the country, <coughs> reopening the grief that so many felt over the loss of their loved ones. Now, I've listened carefully to the Minister's responses, and she said basically that she's unable to compel the public inquiry to move more quickly. It is above her pay grade. grade. But what she could do right now is commit to lobbying the government to complete that public inquiry before the end of the year. She could commit to doing everything she possibly can to bringing those answers forward for all those families who are today feeling so deeply hurt and upset. Minister. Well, so, uh, first, on the first point of her question, and she's wrong about the, the use of public health advice, and all decisions were informed uh, by public health advice, but on, the, on her, her request for the public inquiry, the public inquiry is independent of government. It's independent of government, so what she's asking me to do is not something I can do. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Just to reiterate the points that my um, colleague just made there, every time there's a statement, every time there's a revelation, every time there's an issue about this raised, whether in this House or in the press, it triggers trauma for so many people who haven't healed over losing their loved ones, so many people who were not able to go to funerals, so many people who were not able to seek closure. I hope that the Minister will reflect on that in terms of her statement this afternoon. Just to come back on the public inquiry, does she agree with me and the COVID bereaved families for justice who said that these revelations show why um, the bereaved families must be heard in the hearings for our lawyers to cross-examine um, people, including the former Secretary of State for Health, so we can get full answers to our questions in the right setting instead of having to relive the horrors of our loss through these exposés? <laughs> Well, as I've said, you know, what we are talking about is, very sadly, people's lives lost. And that is people's you know, 
mothers and fathers, grands and grandpas, sons and daughters, sisters, brothers. We should always remember when we talk about this the genuine, real human cost. And also all those who, for instance, work in health and social care looked after people who were dying and had such a traumatic time themselves. So she talks about uh, trauma. I will say uh, that it's her front bench who uh, asked this urgent question and has made this conversation happen in this forum rather, for instance, than happening in the context of a public inquiry, which might encourage a more reasoned form of uh, debate. I say, but my tone, I hope she'll notice, fully appreciates the points that she makes, but it's not for me to dictate who will be giving evidence to the public inquiry. Justin Mathers. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As the Minister will recall, uh, I spoke for the opposition on, on dozens of regulations to do with the pandemic, and there were occasions during that when uh, I questioned some of the decisions that were being made, and the suspicion was that sometimes political rather than medical and scientific uh, decisions were being taken. Clearly, what has come out overnight has caused me to question that again. I hope she can understand. Uh, why that is an important question of trust for us as politicians but also for the wider public and does she agree with me that rather than a partial uh, and selective release of information to sell newspapers or books that actually the public deserve the government to release all information now yeah. so that we can actually get to the yeah. bottom of this yeah, yeah, yeah. well I, I do indeed remember many of those um, SI uh, debates I can assure him but it wasn't political decision making as he yeah. suggests. So every step of the way, ministers such as myself, the health sector, and of course the Prime Minister, making incredibly difficult decisions, but always trying to do the right thing to save people's lives, to protect people from this cruel virus, which particularly attacked those who were most vulnerable, such as the frail elderly, and in doing so, continuously took public health advice. Um, and to his, uh, to, to, to his point, actually, that the way to look into all this that happened is indeed through the public inquiry. That's where the evidence is being provided, and that's a forum in which the reflections can be taken and the lessons can be learned. Leila Moran. Madam Deputy Speaker, my heart first and foremost goes out to those bereaved families. I just can't imagine what they must be feeling again today. Um, and my heart also goes out to those care workers, many of whom also lost their lives. Mm -hmm but also many of them survived having contracted COVID and now are living with long COVID. So they may not have lost their lives, but many did lose their livelihoods. The minister may be aware that advice from the Industrial Industry, uh, Injuries Advisory Council, which would give compensation to just some of those brave workers, is currently with the Department of Work and Pensions. In a recent meeting with me, uh, the Minister told me that it could take years for this to be taken up. Can the Minister tell me what conversations has she had with DWP? And if it is going to take years, will her department set up a compensation scheme so they get the support that those brave workers deserve? Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As she says, uh, care workers who are amongst those who were at the front line at the pandemic and you know, had some really incredibly difficult uh, experiences uh, and work through you know, even taking the risk themselves of uh, catching COVID and very sadly some care workers along with NHS workers were amongst those who lost their lives. As she said, others indeed uh, have a long COVID. Um, she asked me about compensation, which is indeed something with, that is currently with the Department for Work and Pensions. In fact, a minister from that department is here on the bench. I know his department is looking at this and will be responding in due course. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister yes. for her answers? And, and truly, everyone's th um, thoughts and prayers are with those of all, all those who lost loved ones. The, the impact to mental health of the COVID lockdown has been felt most keenly in care homes. And to see what the elderly people were put through and learning that the full protections were not in place, and yet they couldn't see loved ones at the end of life, is totally unacceptable. What would the Minister offer to those who lost precious hours with those they loved and adored on hearing this very, very uh, tragic news today? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I will reiterate to those living in care homes, but of course their uh, loved ones and families as well, that the government took every step all the way through the pandemic to protect those who we knew were 
vulnerable. For instance, prioritising testing, over 180 million tests going to care homes during the course of the pandemic, prioritising vaccinations. And I remember at the time talking to residents in care homes and how the vaccination for them was such a huge moment because actually it was the first time they really felt they were protected from this truly cruel uh, virus. Um, it's also, you know, I know how incredibly hard it was for families that they couldn't be with loved ones in care homes. One reason why we put out guidance about visiting, particularly saying somebody cl was close to end of life, that they should be able to receive uh, visitors. I will continue to do my utmost as Minister for Social Care to make sure that we do our very best for those living in care homes. I thank the uh, Minister for answering the urgent question. Uh, we now come to a statement. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, with your permission, today I can announce that we intend to legislate as soon as possible to introduce an independent public advocate to put victims and the bereaved at the heart of our response to large-scale public disasters, to make sure that they get the support they deserve through public inquests and inquiries, and to make sure they get the answers they need to move forward with their lives. And I know, Madam Deputy Speaker, the whole House will recall that fateful day on the 15th of April 1989 when thousands of fans prepared to watch the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. 97 men, women and children lost their lives, unlawfully killed in our country's worst ever sporting disaster. What happened at Hillsborough was uh, a monumental and devastating tragedy. I remember watching the scenes uh, in horror uh, to this day, and of course, the impact is felt to this day, especially by the families and the friends of the victims. Of course, for Hillsborough survivors and the bereaved, that terrible day was just the beginning of a 34 year ordeal. It was followed by an appalling injustice, fans blamed for their own injuries, survivors and bereaved blocked at every turn in their search for answers. And frankly, Madam Deputy Speaker, we must learn the lessons of Hillsborough and we must make sure that they never happen again. In terms of the wider context, major disasters involving significant loss of life are mercifully quite rare in the United Kingdom. But as Hillsborough, Grenfell, the Manchester bombings have shown, when they do happen, victims, families and the communities reflected and represented have not received the answers to their questions have not received the support they need. And we are duty bound as a government, as a house, to make sure that doesn't happen again and to ensure positively that those families, those communities, never again have to struggle in anguish against a system created to help them in order to get the truth and some measure of accountability. Madam Deputy Speaker, the independent public advocate go some way to making good on this government's long-standing promise to ensure that that pain, that suffering of the Hillsborough victims and other victims is never repeated again. I can tell the House it will be passed into law, it will be made up of a panel of experts to guide survivors and the bereaved in the aftermath of a major disaster. And it will deliver for them in, I think, six important respects that I want to outline before the House. First, the IPA will provide practical support to the families of the deceased and individuals or their representatives who have suffered a devastating or life-changing injury. This practical support includes things like helping them to understand their rights, such as the right to receive certain information at inquests or inquiries, signposting them to support services, for example, financial or mental health support. In particular, the IPA will help victims every step of the way from the immediate aftermath of a tragic event right the way through to the conclusion of investigations, inquiries or inquests. We will make IPA support available to the closest next of kin relative, both parents, where they are separated or divorced, or to a close friend if there is no close family. And Madam Deputy Speaker, the support will also be there for the bereaved whose loved ones die after the tragedy as a result of their injuries. It was a particular issue in relation to Grenfell as well, I know from my experience as Housing Minister. The IPA will also offer support to injured victims and their representatives. 
Second, Madam Deputy Speaker, the IPA will give victims, critically, a voice when they need it most. It will advocate on their behalf with public authorities and the government, for example, where they have concerns about the engagement uh, and the responsiveness of public authorities, whether it's the police, local authorities or the like, or where victims and bereaved want an investigation or an inquiry set up more swiftly to ensure maximum transparency. Third, the IPA will give a voice to the wider community, not just the direct, if you like, victims and bereaved, which have been affected most by the tragedy in question. And to achieve this, we will set up a register of advocates from a range of different professions, backgrounds and geographical areas, including doctors, social workers, emergency workers, members of the clergy, people with media handling experience, because often that is uh, another burden uh, which they will not have experienced, and others. And so communities will be able to nominate an advocate to act on their behalf in order to express their particular concerns and ensure that their voice is heard as a community. Fourth, Madam Deputy Speaker, the IPA will be supported by full-time permanent staff so that it can act very swiftly when a tragedy occurs and make sure the support is there for the victims, for the families, from day one. And critically in this regard, the IPA will be there to consult with and represent victims and their families before any inquiry is set up. So the IPA will be able to make representations on the type of inquiry, whether it's statutory or non-statutory, and other important functional issues such as the data controller powers available to any inquiry and the relationship they may have with the IPA in the exercise of such functions. Fifth, the scope of the eye will be uh, extended to cover events in England and Wales, but of course, mindful of the devolved settlements, we will uh, work with all the devolved administrations to ensure our plans are coordinated with the support that's being offered outside of England and Wales. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, although the IEPA is first and foremost about doing better by the victims and the survivors, I think it is also worth acknowledging that it will be in the wider interest of the public. It will ensure we achieve better relationship between public bodies, government and the bereaved, that we get better, quicker answers and are able to learn and act on the lessons from such tragedies more decisively. I can tell the House that the preparatory work is now well underway to establish the IPA and we will place it on a statutory footing as soon as is possible and I'll say more about the legislative vehicle uh, shortly. Now of course there have been other important reforms over recent years to support and empower victims and their families. We've made inquests more sympathetic to the bereaved with a refreshed accessible guide to coroner services. So the, the process if you like which can obviously feel like a minefield to navigate is a bit easier to digest and understand. We've removed means test funding for the exceptional case funding for legal representation at an inquest, which means that applying for legal aid is easier and less intrusive. Uh, people who have suffered a traumatic bereavement no longer have to submit the details of their personal finances to the legal aid agency. And if their case meets the exceptional case funding criteria, they'll be entitled to legal aid, whatever that means. More broadly, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are putting victims at the heart of our justice system with a quadrupling of victims' funding compared to 2010 and with the louder voice through the fourth of the, the upcoming Victims' Bill. So the creation of an independent public advocate to give greater voice to the victims and the bereaved of major tragedies is the next important step forward. Now, I know that members across this House will want to join me in paying tribute to the Hillsborough families for their courage and their determination despite every setback and their long-standing struggle to stop other families from enduring the same anguish in the future. The Hillsborough families have always maintained that their struggle for truth and justice for the 97 was of national significance and I agree entirely. And I also want to pay tribute to the families of those who died at Grenfell and the Manchester Arena bombing. Our hearts go out to them for their loss, and I pay tribute to them for their dignified courage. May I also take this opportunity to pay tribute to those in this House and the other place who have campaigned on this tire tirelessly. Um, uh, the Right Honourable Member for uh, Maidenhead, the Right Honourable Member for Garston and Halewood, uh, the Honourable Member for Liverpool West Derby, 
uh, the noble Lord Lord Wills, uh, the Mayor of Liverpool and others for their steadfast commitment to establishing an IPA. I will continue to work closely with all of those honourable members, uh, the Hillsborough families, the Grenfell groups, the families of the victims of the Manchesterina bombing to ensure that their experiences are taken into account and we get the detail of this right as we establish the IPA. May I also pay particular tribute to the Right Reverend James Jones, KBE, for his work on Hillsborough and his important report. I met with him last week. The Government will be responding to the wider report this spring and we know in our heads and in our hearts that there is still much more to do to heal the wounds from that horrendous and heartbreaking tragedy. But this is an important step forward. The IPA will make a real difference, and I commend the statement to the House. Shadow Secretary of State Steve Root. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by thanking the Secretary of State for advanced sight of his statement. For decades, the Hillsborough families fought for justice. They fought for the truth about how 97 innocent children, women and men were unlawfully killed yeah. in wholly unavoidable circumstance, in wholly avoidable circumstances. They faced a cover-up by public authorities who hid the truth and blamed the victims. Yeah. These brave families did more than seek justice for their loved ones. They sought to shine a light on what had gone so tragically wrong, because that's how we learn how not to make the same mistake again, but it should never have taken over three decades. I was in Sheffield on that fateful day in 1989, just a mile or so from Hillsborough with a junior doctor friend who was called back to the hospital to treat the victims and deal with, with the aftermath. So I remember vividly the horror of what we heard unfolding from the football stadium. Today, I pay tribute to those families for their long struggle for justice and to those who have spoken up for them, notably the Right Honourable Member for Garston and Halewood, the Honourable Member for Liverpool, West Derby, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, the former Prime Minister, Lord Wills and the Mayor of Manchester. Today is a chance to balance the scales of justice and give those victims the voice they need and the power to make it heard but it's a chance the government has missed. The government's proposals don't go far enough and they will be too weak as they currently stand to prevent cover-ups in future. The public advocate needs to be a fully independent, permanent figure accountable to the families, not a panel of advisers appointed by the government if they see fit as a signposting service. It's critical that the public advocate has the full power of a data controller, not just the power to make representations, exactly. as we just heard from the Secretary of State. That means the power to access all data, communications, documents and other information to torpedo cover-ups before they can even happen. Yeah. Now, we know from the Hillsborough Independent Panel that the existence of these powers would be a massive deterrent to future cover-ups. So, I would ask the judge to wake this government up. How many more lives need to be lost? Labour is committed to real change. In government, we will establish a fully independent public advocate accountable to survivors and to victims' families, and we will arm them with the power they need to access documents and data to expose the truth about what went wrong, and importantly, to stop cover-ups before they can happen. That will be part of a Hillsborough law with teeth that will also give fa victims' families access to legal aid and impose a duty of candour on public officials. We'll do that because we believe victims must be at the heart of the justice system, because we believe victims must have a voice and the power to make it heard, and because we understand that a system that fails to learn from its mistakes is doomed to repeat them. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, Steve. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank him for uh, his, uh, his partial welcome of this announcement? I listened very carefully to what he said. I have to say, um, uh, we share, uh, and I share with him personally, uh, the commitment and the desire to uh, set up 
the most credible advocacy for the bereaved and the victims and the families. Um, and, and of course, I'm very happy to work with him and honourable members on all sides in relation to the detail. But I don't accept his characterisation. He, uh, he, he said it wasn't uh, uh, independent, uh, but in fact, it would be decided on the basis of consultations with the victims and the bereaved. And that must be right in order to make sure you have the right range of experts to deal with the particular circumstances uh, of the tragedy in question. It would act on their behalf. It would not act on behalf of the government. Uh, the data controller powers he's referred to, I understand exactly the point he, uh, he makes. And as I said in my, in my statement, it would be important that there will be uh, consultation with the families and the IPA will be able to consult with an, uh, a putative independent inquiry. But I think he has to recognise that the independent inquiry will have many of those powers itself and therefore how will he reconcile that with duplicated powers in an IPA? Um, but this is something we should talk about and I know it's being raised by the Honourable Lady. But I would genuinely say we want to get this right but I think actually what, what you risk is a conflict of functions, which is what we would all want to avoid. He mentioned other me measures like the duty of candour. That is a broader issue for the government's report to the wider uh, 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 Hillsborough report. That is expected in spring. I know it's been a long time coming, but those broader issues, I think it's right to deal with them. Uh, I felt, in relation to the IPA, uh, that although it is only part of the redress and the accountability, that we were in a position not just to bring forward the policy announcement, but also in due course very shortly to be able to say something about the legislative vehicle. And it's important for the bereaved, for the victims, for the families, and because it's such an important issue, to bring that forward now and not to wait any longer. Uh, Theresa May. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for bringing this statement to the House today? and welcome the decision to introduce an independent public advocate, which was, of course, a commitment in our 2017 manifesto. But I'm sure my right honourable friend will understand that I want to ensure that this body is going to meet the ambition of the commitment that we made in that manifesto. And I'm happy to work with him to do that. But for today, could he please just go back on two particular issues? One is this question of whether the families, the victims, the survivors will be able themselves to initiate the independent public advocate so that they are not relying on the government to do that for them. Because certainly in the case of Hillsborough, it was the fact that the state and state authorities shut their doors to people that led to the 34 years wait for any answers for the uh, families. And also in line with that, will he look again or ensure that the IPA has the ability to compel the provision of information and evidence to the families. He is assuming an inquiry is always going to take place. That might not be the case. It is essential that the families have answers to their perfectly reasonable questions. Can I thank my right honourable friend and pay tribute again to her for uh, her campaigning and her advocacy on this. On the right of initiative, uh, ultimately the government will have to decide um, the uh, shape and of course uh, of any IPA that is set up. But of course one of the challenges will be, uh, and there is clearly set out uh, the right of consultation, is where there are different views that are expressed as to quite how the IPA should be configured for a particular inquiry and ultimately the government will have to try and reconcile that where there are differences. So I do think it is right, I do think it is right while committing to an IPA to allow the government to engage, to allow victims, the bereaved, the families, uh, the power of initiative to call for that and to make their representations, but allow the government to decide the, the, the precise uh, configuration of it. I, I, I listened very carefully to what my right honourable friend said about the compulsion of evidence. Uh, I think, uh, I'm, as, as, I, as I said before, very happy to engage with her and other honourable members as this comes forward. The piece that we need to reconcile, and I take her point that it may, may not be a, 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 an inquiry set up, but where there is, making sure that we do not have conflicting powers. But again, I'm very happy on the detail of this and on the clauses in due course to work with the right honourable lady. Uh, Maria Reed. I welcome the fact that the government wants to legislate for a public advocate after uh, five years after the consultation that they undertook closed. But I am 
very disappointed with the provisions as he set them out. Now, his proposed public advocate wouldn't be independent. It wouldn't be a data controller. It would not be able to act only at the behest of families. It would be directed by the Secretary of State. It wouldn't have the power to appoint independent panels, such as the Hillsborough Independent Panel, but at a much earlier stage following a disaster than the 23 years it took us to get that report out. And it wouldn't have the power to use transparency to get at the truth at an early stage and torpedo the cover-ups that public authorities set about undertaking in the aftermath of disasters. This must be something that the families themselves can initiate, that they can use to get at the truth at an early stage. The fact that the public advocate would have the power to compel, to produce documentation, to shine the light of transparency on what public authorities have done in the immediate aftermath of a disaster would stop cover-ups. It would mean that you wouldn't have 34 years later people still having to find out and fight to get at the truth. That is the prize within our grasp if we set this up right, Madam Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah. So does he accept that he'll be missing an opportunity, an important opportunity to stop things going wrong for families if he doesn't beef up his proposals uh, significantly? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can tell him. For what it's worth, I'm perfectly willing to indicate to him in detail quite how they ought to be improved. I thank the Honourable Lady, and I know she's worked very tirelessly, and we've had very right Honourable Lady, and we've had uh, very good engagement on this, and I'm happy for that to continue. I, I, I take her point about the power of initiative. The families of the bereaved will have a power of uh, uh, initiative through consultation, but in the last analysis, particularly if there's conflicting views, and, and, and I've seen that before firsthand, the government will have to reconcile those. Um, and secondly, on this data point, I, I think the problem, and, and I'm happy to keep listening and working with on this, the problem is going to be if you have an inquiry which has powers to compel evidence of its own, how you reconcile those where uh, they're competing uh, in, a, in a process. But as I said, um, it is important to bring this forward. There's going to be full scrutiny on this. And uh, as I said, as we develop the clauses, I'm very happy to keep working with the, Honourable Lady, the right Honourable Lady. Chair of the Justice Select Committee, Sir Robert Neill. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and can I pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for uh, uh, Garson and Halewood for the work that she has done yeah. as a fellow member of the Justice Select Committee, and to my Right Honourable Friend, the former Prime Minister. Uh, the former Prime Minister's point is an important one uh, about the risk of cover-ups by those in authority. And that's why, whilst I very much welcome what the Secretary of State has said, it's an important step forward. Uh, I hope when engaging as to how best we refine and advance these proposals, you look again at the Justice Select Committee's recommendation that there should be an extension of legal aid availability, although already, impro already improved, we should be extending non-means tested legal aid to all cases where there are mass fatalities or where public bodies are potentially at fault. Because it's not fair, there's no equality of arms when those public bodies are represented by teams of lawyers but the bereaved families have to rely upon sometimes getting legal aid, sometimes not, or pro bono representation. Exactly. Equality of arms would surely mean representation in those cases as a matter of right. Can I thank the Chair of the Select Committee? Um, I think this will uh, 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 create a, a stronger advocacy on behalf of the, uh, the bereaved and the victims and the, and the families, uh, and having uh, the panels with the expertise, the range and, frankly, the status will go a long way to getting the answers. I understand, again, the point around compulsion of evidence. Uh, it, it's not a, a, a theological objection to it, uh, certainly as far as I'm concerned. It's a question of reconciling competing powers when an inquiry uh, is set up. I will, of course, look at the Justice Select Committee's um, uh, report and recommendations on this. I think just on inquiries in general, of course, they're not supposed to be adversarial, which is why uh, uh, the, 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 the rules uh, in relation to legal aid uh, are as they are. But we will look and work with colleagues on all sides of the House as we bring forward the, uh, these important clauses. Ian Bird. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Secretary of State's acknowledgement that we need a independent public advocates into legislation, but I'm really sorry this announcement today is a pale imitation of what Hillsborough families and survivors spent years campaigning on. The Government's proposal feels like 
a signposting service, a weak signposting service, doesn't have any powers that a truly independent public advocate would require. It feels so weak. So for me, the, feel, the key question is, would this proposal have stopped the state cover-ups of Hillsborough, contaminated blood scandal, and so many other cover-ups over the ages? And will it prevent further cover-ups? Unfortunately, I've got to say no. So will he instead adopt my honourable friend, the member for Garden Hill, was built that is ready to go? and work with us to bring the hills below, including a fully independent public advocate, into legislation. Well, can I uh, thank the Honourable Gentleman and pay tribute to all his efforts. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I don't accept the uh, characterisation. It is, it, calling it a signposting service is, is, is quite wrong. It will, it, by the way, the signposting is important, but it is the start, not the end, of the role of the IPA. It will be uh, uh, set up as a statutory advocate for all of those uh, who have been affected, whether they're individual victims or on behalf of the community as a whole, it will, have, as of its own status, uh, be very uh, impossible to ignore. Uh, on the uh, specific functions beyond uh, the ones that I set out in my statement, I'm very happy to keep uh, engaging, but I think uh, honourable members need to, to think about the practicalities, uh, for example, with data compulsion uh, and how we make sure that they can be reconciled. But I hope that uh, we'll be able to continue working together to make sure that victims and the bereaved, particularly uh, of uh, pre-existing tragedies like Hillsborough, but also those in the future, feel that like, they're better equipped to get the answers they need and the accountability they need. Edward Timpson. Speaker. And can I join other members in welcoming today's statement and the important step forward that, that it, it brings, uh, as well as recognising that the legislative process that is to follow will provide opportunities to look to strengthen the role and ensure it delivers uh, what uh, we set out all the way back in 2017, uh, not least trying to ensure that we can safeguard the independence of the IPA from government. Uh, but can I ask my right honourable friend, in relation to survivors, uh, and, and how that will be defined uh, through this new role, whether that will <coughs> simply be those who have had a life-changing injury or whether it will also include those who may have been physically or mentally uh, 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 changed by their experience of a disaster they've been involved with and their need to have support and advice through that inquiry process. Can I thank my uh, hon. Friend? Um, we'll work very closely with him and colleagues uh, on the definition. I think it's important to get that right. Um, uh, and uh, it will be uh, an independent advocate once it's established uh, with the full force uh, of uh, expression and advocacy to get the answers that are required. Um, but I'm, as I said before, very happy to work with colleagues to make sure that we get uh, the right balance uh, and in particular get it to, to be as effective as possible uh, whether it's in relation to an inquiry statute or otherwise, or indeed when an inquiry is not established. Dan Carden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank the Secretary of State for coming to the House today and the willingness uh, to legislate in this area. But I think, as he's heard already today, nothing less than an independent public advocate that is uh, acting at the behest of families, not directed by the Secretary of State and with specific powers will do. Can I ask him how is he engaging with honourable members in this place, others who have uh, campaigned on these uh, issues for years, and most importantly the Hillsborough families? My constituent Deanna Matthews wrote to me her uncle Brian was unlawfully killed at Hillsborough uh, to share her dismay about the lack of engagement with bereaved families ahead of this. So can he tell me how he is engaging with those concerned? The Honourable Gentleman, um, just to be clear, it will be entirely independent once it's established, um, so it's not accurate the characterisation. Um, in terms of engagement, uh, I'm caught a little bit uh, between the strictures of uh, the Speaker in terms of making announcements to this place first, um, in terms of the detail. But I wrote to, I, I, I wrote to the, um, uh, the, the families and the bereaved and the various different groups, Hillsborough, Grenfell, the Manchester bombings. So they've had advanced sight. But of course, one of the concerns now is the, the, the lack of detail, which of course I couldn't provide uh, in, in, in advance of the statement. But I did consult um, 
uh, uh, Bishop uh, 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 James Jones, uh, indeed I saw him over the last week, uh, and I'm very committed to working with all of those families, and I know that Grenfell United and some of those well from my time as Housing Minister, to make sure that we get this right, and above all, uh, the most effective means of giving them the transparency and the accountability they need. Rob Butler. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I warmly welcome this announcement by the Government of the establishment of an independent um, public advocate and also pay tribute to uh, the Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Garston and Hellwood, with whom I sat on the Justice Select Committee and I know has worked tirelessly on this for, for many, many years. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was at university at the time of the Hillsborough disaster in Sheffield. Sadly, a friend of mine died in that tragedy, and so I know all too well the frustration that the bereaved families have felt ever since. Uh, can my right honourable friend uh, tell us in a little bit more detail how, will he, how he will ensure that the families of the bereaved of the Hillsborough disaster will be fully involved in the practicalities of the establishment of the advocate? I thank uh, my honourable friend, and, and uh, I'm very sorry for his loss in relation to Hillsborough. Uh, I mentioned some of the engagement. I've offered to meet with uh, the families and the groups, not just of Hillsborough, but uh, in relation to Grenfell uh, and the Manchester Arena bombings. Uh, I've always found in these cases where you're facing uh, the bereaved or the survivors of such a dire tragedy, that the most important thing is that they feel that they've got access, and I'm very happy to, as I said, to meet with any of them. Alison McGovern. Madam Deputy Speaker, I shared a view of my friend, the member for Garston and Hale Wood, and I just wonder if the Secretary of State has actually read the Hansard of previous debates yeah. on this issue, because 12 years and five months ago, the member for Halton, the member for Garston and Hale Wood, and many other members of this House and I stood here in order to have the power to compel the government to release papers on Hillsborough and to get transparency over that information. And yet, all that time later, here we are again, still debating who has the power to compel information. In other words, Madam Deputy Speaker, how we as citizens can have the power to get to the truth. I also want to ask the Secretary of State about the duty of candour and extending that to public servants so that they have to proactively tell the truth. Because without this information, we will, as the member for Garson and Halewood have said, we will always be liable to these cover -ups. I saw it through all of this process with Hillsborough, with Lackanel House, with Grenfell, with the COVID inquiry, again and again and again. And I want the Secretary of State to understand this issue properly. It's about the truth. So will he explain what he's going to do on duty of candour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I thank the uh, Honourable Lady? And I know she cares about this subject deeply. Uh, I am familiar with these challenges from my time as Housing Minister, aside from the issue of Hillsborough, which I followed um, closely. Uh, on the issue of the duty of candour, I totally understand uh, the importance of that, and I've never said that the IPA is the whole picture. I said it's a partial, uh, 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 but an important step that we take, um, and better to get on with it, because I think uh, after so long, uh, one thing I get from the communities and the victims and the survivors is the need to get on with tangible action. That's the way we'll restore confidence. But the duty of candour is something that was included uh, in uh, the report by Bishop James Jones, and therefore it is right that that is part of the response that the Home Office brings. And I know uh, it's previously been set out, they will publish that response in the spring, and of course it will cover that issue. Sir Julian Lewis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Will my right honourable ex friend explain in a little, little more detail at what point and under what circumstances the availability of the advocate will be triggered? I see that uh, he can be involved in not just um, uh, inquiries but also inquests. So how large a tragedy does it have to be before uh, the victims bereaved can call upon his or her services. Can I thank uh, uh, the chair of the select committee, uh, my honourable friend? He raises a very good uh, point. The principle is that it's there for major tragedies. Uh, this is a, uh, a specific uh, institution set up with a range of expertise designed to deal with that, uh, and so it's not dealing with. Um, uh, one loss of life or, 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 or a smaller event like that. And I think on the definition, we'll need to work very closely uh, with honourable members to get... 
to get that right. Um, well, th there are some many good things in the, hon the Right Honourable Ladies uh, Private Members Bill, but I think uh, there's more actually that we can do than, than just that. And, and there are some areas where, as, as she knows from her engagement with me, and we talked about this at some length, whilst I'm always happy to continue engaging, we take a different view. But the most important thing, and I think um, uh, my Honourable Friend has made this point very well, is to make sure it's as effective as possible. Uh, I'm committed to that, and I'm committed to working with Honourable Members on all sides. Derek Twig. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, because you know uh, I was at the Hillsborough disaster, and along with my honourable friend, the member for uh, Garston and Hellwood, we worked very, very closely with the families, uh, particularly in the lead up and deciding of the independent panel. So we do know quite a bit about the impact on families and what families want and victims. So I, I came here today when I saw the heading, Madam Speaker, saying it's an independent public advocate. What I'm going away from today, Madam Deputy Speaker, is I'm not sure what independent means. Uh, because the government hasn't set out clearly how independence will be. It appears to me from what the, what the Secretary of State has said that actually it won't be totally independent. And I'm surprised, given that there's been so much discussion in this chamber, and my, again, my honourable <coughs> friend and member for uh, Hellwood and Ga Garston and Hellwood. So there's been plenty of discussion, but the Secretary of State's come here today, and I think we're a bit, it's a bit muddled. What is independence, he means? Because if it's truly independent, it means it's independent, and ministers have no role in that whatsoever. Uh, to be clear, uh, on the right of initiative, which I know the Right Honourable Lady has raised and included in her bill, that is something where, because you could get uh, different views as to the shape or the scope, uh, that, that is something that uh, the government will have to ultimately have the last word on. But frankly, what he said about it not being independent is, is wholly wrong, uh, and we ought to be very clear. From, it, from its point of establishment in relation to a tragedy, it will be wholly and entirely independent to serve uh, the victims, the bereaved, the survivors, and only them. It could, I couldn't be clearer on the subject. Kevin Foster. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, a lot of this statement is very welcome and hoping to balance the <coughs> position for families and victims, uh, not least when they had the unedifying sight of actually those phalanxes of lawyers they were facing, knowing they were actually being paid for uh, by their own taxes and by public funds to sometimes cover up the impact on their relatives. I must say, I don't find myself particularly persuaded on the points he's made around the compulsion of evidence, which would strike me as something that does need to be part of this. But in terms of his preparation work, which he referred to, what is the timeline he has set for that preparation work in terms of this, this institution being up and ready pending the legislation coming through this House? Well, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? He makes a good point. Uh, the policy work is quite far developed, but of course we haven't foreclosed options in order that we can have maximum transparency and proper engagement. Uh, we'll, uh, I need to identify the right um, legislative vehicle, um, and then it will take as long as the House takes to, to, to enact it. But I hope to say more on the legislative vehicle very shortly. Dame Diana Johnson. Can I just put to the Secretary of State that in the case of the contaminated blood scandal, governments failed to acknowledge what had actually happened for decades. Even though thousands of people had been harmed and died, and it's now recognised as one of the worst treatment disasters in the history of the NHS. So how would this independent public advocate work in the circumstances where incidents happen uh, over many years, across many parts of the United Kingdom, and when governments fail to come clean about the involvement of the state for years and deny there was a problem. So what confidence would victims actually have in a system where the government decide whether an independent public advocate was appointed? Like, can I, first of all, uh, we're talking about um, uh, the final configuration of the IPA uh, and the decision to uh, the, the immediate consultation will take place uh, with the families and with the bereaved. In relation to, in relation to how it would help in a, in a scenario like that, that is precisely why, and, and with the greatest respect to the right hon. Lady, we went for a panel approach so that we had the range of experts because a disaster like that would be quite different from, say, Hillsborough or, um, or Grenfell, and therefore it's important that the IPA has the range of expertise. And quite frankly, the minute an IPA is established, the questions that it asks 
And I take the point about compulsion of data and evidence, and that's something I'm very happy to keep looking at. But from the moment an independent public advocate started asking those questions, I think, given the nature of its status in the statute, you would uh, break down many of the barriers that previous, uh, previously have faced victims in these, in these situations. Uh, Andy Carter. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I agree fully with my right honourable friend when he says getting the detail right is vital in this process. And uh, I'm very pleased with the tone he's taken in, in some of the comments he's made that he is willing to work with members from across the House to reach the right settlement for victims uh, to ensure that this process is right for the future. I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about the panel that he plans and in particular will victims be able to be fully represented? Can they elect people to go onto this panel uh, to advocate for, for people involved in a tragedy? Can I thank my honourable friend? He's, he's right. The point of having a range of expertise on the panels rather than a single uh, public advocate is precisely to ensure that you've got a range of expertise to deal with the kind, the nature of the, of the tragedy that is unfolding, uh, but also to allow um, the victims, the bereaved, the families to be able to be properly consulted. In addition, in addition, they will have the ability to nominate, if you like, a community uh, 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 um, level representative on, on that, pa on that um, panel to make sure that as well as dealing with technical issues, to make sure that as well as individuals uh, being represented, the community as a whole and the community concerns often expressed as a whole are properly reflected in that advocacy. Margaret Greenwood. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to the Hillsborough families and all of those affected for their tireless campaign over decades to establish the truth of what happened and their determination to make sure that families do not have to suffer the injustices that they've been forced to endure. And I would pay tribute in particular to the Honourable Member for uh, right on member for Maidenhead and for Garston Halewood for all of their hard work on this. The Minister's talking about a conflict between the IPA and any inquiry, but surely he must recognise that it is vital that victims and families can feel confident that they have a truly independent advocate. And surely he must recognise too that by definition you can't have too much transparency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I certainly agree with the thrust of that and it will be fully independent once it's established uh, and with all the powers of advocacy and the expertise to give voice and expression to the victims and bereaved. I do think though on this issue of uh, compulsion of data or access to, to evidence that we need to make sure that we are, not, we are reconciling that with what a, an inquiry might be, uh, uh, what powers an inquiry might be exercising and make sure that we don't end up with either a legal muddle or an ineffective process. Dr. Kieran Mullen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I also want to join uh, colleagues in paying tribute to my uh, fellow member of the Justice Select Committee, Member for Garston and Hayward, for her long campaigning on this issue, which I think the whole House recognises. I, I am interested in this issue of, of legal representation that other members of the House have raised. How would the IPA interact and, and what support might be there in terms of accessing legal advice when, as others have said, you potentially facing public bodies with very well funded legal teams that you, as, as the family and members, won't necessarily have access to? Yeah, can I thank the honourable gentleman, my honourable friend? He's, he, ma he makes an important point. Um, in general, inquests um, uh, uh, should be inquisitorial, fact finding processes, and the 2019 review into legal aid, which you may recall for inquests, underlined the importance that we keep it that way. There are, of course, circumstances, uh, for example, Article 2 inquests. Uh, or where there's a significant public interest in the outcome where legal representation may be available uh, under the exceptional case funding. And I mentioned a little bit more about the detail of how that would work in my statement. Whitley. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin, Mr. Speaker. In order for bereaved families to have confidence in an independent public advocate, then it needs to be truly independence of governments. That means acting on the directions of families and not the Secretary of State exercising the powers of a data controller and being empowered to establish independent panels. Elkin Abrahamson, the co-author of the Hillsborough Law, has said that this government's engagement with the Hillsborough family has been almost non-existent, and it shows. Will the Justice Secretary, Secretary now commit to meeting with the Hillsborough families with a view to revising these proposals and bringing them into line with what the Hillsborough families have been calling for for so long? Well, well, gentlemen, and as I've already uh, made clear, uh, the level of engagement we've had before, and of course, I'm very willing to meet with representatives uh, or indeed directly with uh, the families involved. 
Bradford. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Secretary of State couldn't divulge to those families who have been campaigning the detail of his announcement today. But does he believe that they would recognise what he's announced today as what they've been campaigning for on behalf of the, the, the people they lost in terms of an independent uh, 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 advocate? Uh, and would they recognise what he's announced today as what they've been campaigning for? Gentlemen, I, I hope they would, particularly as they engage uh, and we engage on the detail. It, as I said, it will be fully independent. I take the points about uh, right of initiative and, and uh, powers over data. Uh, we're, we're always willing to look at the detail of how that will work. But actually, what we want to do is make sure we have the most effective means of giving expression and voice to them uh, in their time of need. Emily Buck. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Chloe Rutherford and Liam Curry from South Shields were tragically murdered in the Manchester Arena terror attack. Archaic law in relation to terror attacks prevents their parents registering their precious children's deaths. Last week, they again met with ministers, who this time treated them with contempt, patronised and insulted them. In that meeting, it became clear they have been misled by the government for nearly a year and that this law can be changed, but the government simply chooses not to. Registration is now imminent. The IPA won't help them or other families. How on earth can they believe the Secretary of State when he says victims and the bereaved are at the heart of his response? Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady, I, I think if she looks at what we're doing in the round, um, she can see the steps that we're taking. She, and, and, I, and I'm very mindful and sensitive to... Um, the, the issues that she described, and indeed uh, the constituents that lost their lives um, in that appalling uh, attack. Um, the, the Births and Deaths Registration Act uh, is owned, as, as you'll know, by the Home Office, and the, and the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. They set out the process for registering deaths following an inquest, which required the coroner to inform the register with particulars of the deceased. There isn't, in the way the law is currently configured, any flexibility around this. But again, I reiterate my deepest sympathies to the families who were so tragically bereaved. I uh, thank the um, uh, Secretary of State, Deputy Prime Minister, for his statement. And we now come to the statement from Minister of State, Andrew Mitchell. Uh, with uh, permission, Madam Speaker, I will make a Deputy Speaker. I will make a statement to the House on the situation in Turkey and Syria. I know the House will join me in offering sincere condolences to all those affected by the recent earthquakes. I witnessed firsthand last week the terrible scale of human suffering when I visited Turkey. I also had the opportunity to speak to Syrian partners and the United Nations about their work on the immediate response. I pay tribute to the hundreds of British personnel engaged in specialist health, humanitarian and rescue work in Syria and Turkey. I saw for myself the outstanding work that Britain is doing on the ground to save lives and support those who are suffering. There has been, throughout these events and our responses, excellent coordination across the Foreign Office, Ministry of Defence and Department of Health. Today, Madam Deputy Speaker, the death toll across Turkey and Syria stands at more than 48,000 and at least 118,000 people have been injured. Around 25 million people have been affected with homes, businesses and key infrastructure destroyed. The further earthquakes on the 20th and 27th of February, which have tragically led to additional deaths, show that the danger has not passed. In Syria, this disaster adds to years of turmoil inflicted by conflict, striking hardest in the very place that has borne the brunt of Assad's war machine. I turn, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the initial response. Turkey requested international support immediately after the earthquakes. The UK government delivered aid as swiftly as possible, working closely with Turkey, the United Nations, international partners and NGOs and charities. This included deploying a 77-strong search and rescue team in Turkey, along with state-of-the-art heavy equipment. We quickly announced £4.3 million in new support to Syria Civil Defence, the White Helmets, 
who have carried out search and rescue operations in 60 villages, helping thousands of civilians. The British Government also rapidly engaged with the Turkish Government at the highest level. The Foreign Secretary, my noble friend Lord Ahmed, and I immediately spoke to the senior UN humanitarian officials to ensure a rapid and coordinated response in Syria. As part of the immediate response, the Ministry of Defence and Foreign Office set up a field hospital in Turkulu. This includes an emergency department and a 24-7 operating theatre. And I saw for myself UK Med and Ministry of Defence personnel, 150 of them, working side by side with Turkish medics to save lives. I was deeply impressed and moved during my visit by the life-saving work these teams are doing. Together, they have treated more than 5,000 patients so far. Meanwhile, the UK has delivered 465 tonnes of relief items to Turkey and Syria through civilian and Royal Air Force flights. This includes tents and thermal blankets for families made homeless in freezing conditions, solar lanterns, water purification tablets and hygiene kits. On the 15th of February, we announced a further £25 million of funding to bolster our humanitarian response. This is supporting the work of the UN and aid agencies on the ground in Syria, helping communities ravaged by war as well as this natural disaster. It also continues to support the recovery effort in Turkey led by their government. Beyond our support to the White Helmets, UK-funded charities and NGOs in northern Syria have cared for the injured through mobile medical teams and health centres. The UN has distributed food and other essential items to which the UK has contributed. Further assistance will be delivered in the coming days as part of the UN's Syria Cross-Border Humanitarian Fund, to which the UK is one of the most significant donors. The fund has already allocated $50 million to scale up the response. There is a particular focus on displaced families, the elderly, women, children and people with disabilities. The UK has also supported and bolstered the response through our existing support to key multilateral organisations that are helping in Turkey and Syria. The UN's Global Fund Education Cannot Wait announced a $7 million grant for Syrian children affected by the earthquake, and the Global Partnership for Education will also provide $3.75 million to support the emergency education response. The UK is one of the most significant donors to both funds. We are also a long-standing partner and donor to the World Bank, which announced a $1.7 billion to assist Turkey, and the United Nations Central Emergency Response Fund, the SURF, which has released $50 million for the crisis. Most significant is that our constituents, the British public, have demonstrated extraordinary generosity through the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal, raising more than £100 million. This figure includes £5 million from the UK taxpayer in matched seed funding. In the UK, Madam Deputy Speaker, His Majesty the King visited Turkish diaspora groups and members of the British Syrian community at Syria House, a donation point in Trafalgar Square in London on the 14th of February, and my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, also visited Syria House on the 16th of February. It is clearly vital to ensure that humanitarian aid reaches those who need it as efficiently as possible in Syria. I will continue to engage with the United Nations to ensure maximum access for as long as required. We welcome the accelerated pace of United Nations deliveries and are monitoring the situation closely in the Security Council in New York. The House will understand that the scale of this tragedy is immense. The UK will continue to stand in solidarity with Turkey and with the people of Syria during these most testing of times. I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Shadow Minister Rico Gill. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank the Right Honourable Member for Sutton Coalfield for giving me advance sight of his statement. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have all been deeply shocked by the scenes from Turkey and northwest Syria. The damage done and the loss of life inflicted by these earthquakes and aftershocks is incomprehensible. The death toll between the two countries has surpassed 48,000 people. 
about 25 million people, a staggering figure, have been affected overall with homes, businesses and key infrastructure destroyed. We are looking at a damage area of over 50,000 square kilometres. The Labour Party, and I'm sure each member present today, sends our deepest condolences, our thoughts and sympathies to all those whose lives have been devastated by this appalling tragedy. Yeah, yeah. The many heartfelt contributions from members across this House in the Westminster Hall debate last Thursday demonstrate the strength of support for the people of Syria and Turkey at this time. Turkey is, of course, a close NATO ally and the partner of the United Kingdom, and there are many close ties of family and friendship between us, as with the people of Syria, many of whom have fled from the crisis there to be in the United Kingdom. We are duty-bound as a nation to respond to the challenges posed by this disaster, not just in the short term, but in the long term too, even as the cameras and headlines move on. While we have seen countless images of despair and devastation, I'm sure that all of us have heard the stories of bravery, resilience and hope. I hope that this disaster can show that the spirit of humanitarianism still prevails across much of the world. The response of the British public has, of course, been incredible. Over 30 million donated to the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal in its first day, which has now raised over 100 million. This shows the British public at its best. Yep. Generous, outward-looking and deeply concerned for the welfare of others around the globe. And I would like to take this opportunity to express my thanks to the search and rescue teams that sprang to action within hours of the tragedy to assist in saving people trapped under the rubble of buildings that had collapsed. Speed was absolutely critical in those 72 hours, and I was very proud to see how quickly British forces mobilised on a flight out to Gaziantep. In particular, I want to give my thanks to the volunteers from West Midlands Fire Service, Shayam, Sean, Marg, Mark, Agia, James, Mark, Joe and Paul, who flew out to Turkey, and Rob and Hannah, who supported from the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. The UK Government was right to respond quickly in those first 72 hours, and our support to the White Hamlet Helmets was vital, while humanitarian access to northwest Syria was impeded. And the delivery of medical assistance, rescue equipment and sniffer dogs to the disaster area has been important to help people in the immediate aftermath. However, we are now in a new phase of our response. Our support must not stop there. People are in need of emergency accommodation, food, health care, water and sanitary health, and the largest single need is for emergency, emergency shelter in both countries. The earthquake has not only resulted in additional displacement, but has also diminished the prospects for safe return of internally displaced persons from earthquake-affected areas. Even before the earthquake, an estimated 4.1 million people in northwest Syria relied on aid to meet their basic needs. And the UN estimates that in northwest Syria, 120 schools have been destroyed and 57 hospitals have been partially damaged or forced to suspend their services following the earthquakes. That is absolutely devastating. And for those who survive, hunger, dirty water or the bitter winter cold still pose a significant threat. It is in Britain's interest to support Turkey and Syria. It hosts the largest number of Syrian refugees displaced abroad due to the country's civil war, and in some of the affected areas, 50% of the population in Turkey are refugees. Through multilateralism and common purpose, we can stand together in the face of tragedy and do more than we can alone. The work that the UK has supported through our multilateral partners is, is significant, and a reminder of the many important partnerships that the UK has led in and often helped found over the years. The UN appeals for Turkey and Syria have now been announced with a combined 1.4 billion requested for both countries over the next three months. And as yet, the UK has not announced any further direct support since the launch of these two appeals. What is the Minister doing to coordinate and scale up the humanitarian response with our international partners in the United Nations? And of the 30 million announced so far, can he say over what time frame that will be dispersed? How will this be distributed between the two countries? And crucially, can he confirm where that support has been drawn from and that it will not be taken